What's going on, everybody? Welcome in to the special Saturday, uh, March 16th, 2020 for edition of the Den- Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up Weekly Recap. I am Stuart. I am Michael Tanner. Joined <laughs> by Stuart. Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> nice. This it's been a, a long day, week, but Mike. It was a tough week. It's been a long week, but a great week. We've had lots of great stories, lots of great things coming down. Um, you know, we've... It's too many stories. It's why we run out the weekly recap so you guys can get a flavor of some of the top stuff that have happened this week. As and this Saturday, we've got Robert Bryce. His new I had a great interview with Robert Bryce on his miniseries Juice. Mm. No, we love Robert Bryce, great friend of the show. We've also got Doomberg and Chris Wright coming out, so please stay tuned for that. Um, but remember, guys, as always, energy. Uh, all the stuff is brought to you by EnergyNewsBeat.com. Hit the description below. Visit us online. Take our survey. Take the dashboard. I'm turning it over to the weekly recap, Stu. We'll see you on Monday, folks. Uh, green plating the grid. How utilities exploit the energy transition. Rake in record profit. Michael, this is from Isaac Orr and Mitch Rowling. They are the energy bad boys. And I get a hoot out of reading their sub stack. I highly recommend everybody uh, go out and, and read what they've got going on. Um, here's where they go through. This is one of the single best descriptions of why wind and solar is being pushed by utilities. Let me read this part for you, Michael. Utilities are never going to rival tech companies or biotech companies in terms of growth, but this is the best utilities growth environment that we've seen in decades. When you combine those two big micro themes of electrification and clean energy, seeing utilities with growth like we haven't seen many, many years. These just aren't growth prospects for the next year or two. This is a growth that we can last for a decade or more. A lot of the clean energy goals and electrification goals are out there 2040, 2050. You look at the infrastructure investment that's needed to get to these goals. It's a long runway for utilities. Great quote. That's why the the utilities are a good investment. But here's where a little bit later in here, uh, they start describing on the asset and the depletion of assets on this. When you take a look at the 30 year mark on a energy, I'm in the uh, Miss Producer, if you could slide over the one with the green arrows and a, uh, a downward. Yeah, the uh, depreciation schedule and utility corporate profits yep. over time. Really interesting because what this is showing yep. is the value of the plant over time relative to the corporate profits, which meaning as the longer you have a plant, the less profit is being made because you're paying off more and more of the plant, meaning the depreciation is less offsetting your profit. So while at, and, and what they go on to say is a plant that is fully paid off has some of the lowest cost energy available to the consumer. But if you're a cor- if you're a utility, it offers some <laughs> of the worst economics from your standpoint. So there's always a push to invest new money into capital, whether it's working or not, which is why you which is a really interesting point to show this is why everybody's been moving into wind and solar. They don't care if it works or not, because them spending on infrastructure allows them to fully depreciate and take advantage of this kind of accounting trick. You know, and and I love that this is where we're at. We're innovating by making by taking advantage of the accounting that, you know, real, you know, that's usually a business model that doesn't stick around too long when you're innovating on something other than at least a product. I mean, now right now, oh, we're able to grow because of an accounting trick. Oh, good luck. Oh, uh, they've done such a great job. And if you look down into the the map from the Smart Electric Power Alliance shows the utilities have pledged to achieve 100 percent carbon free net negative net zero reduce emissions. Uh, Miss Producer, if you could slide this map in, um, take a look at that map and net zero or carbon neutral. Look at that big tan area in there, Michael. Yep. 
look at all of California net negative. You've got either net zero or not net negative or a hundred percent carbon free. You're looking at the most expensive uh, uh, electricity in the entire planet yep. or the universe right there. No, it's, 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 it's crazy. The banks, unrealized <laughs> losses. <laughs> The banks unrealized in Q4 securities held banks, bank failures and the dropping of bank count. This one is by uh, Wolf Richer at the Wall Street. He is a good cat. Uh, I like reading his articles and stuff. And so when you come in in here and you take a look in Q4 unrealized losses on securities fell by 206 or 30 percent from the prior quarter to a cumulative loss of four. Uh, 178 billion or 8.8 percent of the 5.43 trillion in securities held by those banks um unbelievable these paper losses started piling up in 2022 (laughs) so when you come down in here uh the bank failures The bank failure issue, Michael, is going to be some serious issues coming around the corner. And back in 1936, there were only five uh, failures without FDIC insured banks. Uh, In 20 and 21, no bank failed. In 2018, no bank failed. 26 and 2005, bank failed, and that was it. So each of the remaining of the 88 years, some bank failed. Uh, in 1989, at the peak, uh, 531 banks failed. Holy smokes. Yeah, I think these, you know, these unrealized losses that he's talking about, he does a good job, in, in my opinion, of splitting them up. You have to think yep. about there's 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 what we call mature, uh, securities or losses that are held in these at in mm. these securities that are what are known as held to maturity, which means they're not going to sell them ever. They're going to hold them out until the life of that you know, security or really it's that 10 year treasury bond pays back. Cause remember you, there's really only so many different ways. If you're talking about government issued um, bonds or treasury securities, those are specifically the 10 and two year yield, which, you know, occasionally in the finance section, I'll throw those numbers out. And that's important to know because those are generally when they buy those treasuries, that's what they're talking about. So there are certain ones that are held to maturity, but then there's also ones that are available that anybody can buy that they basically put on the market. Those actually, um, um, those are make up of over half of the unrealized loss. So you, you've got to, you know, so there, there, there's on both sides of the coin here, you, you've got stuff going and, and, you know, the accounting trickery or whatever between the, the held to maturity ones or the ones that are available is a little bit good, but, yeah, I mean, it, it it's going to get spicy. This is, a again, comes back to when, what does it mean when the Fed's tightening monetary policy? They're raising rates. I mean, we all know that. We've right. talked about, you know, we've talked about at nauseum about how that's sort of, that's what that's what's happening over in China a little bit. And that's what's causing some of this, the stuff that's going on. It's a little bit different over there because of the debt loads here. But we know that the Fed has been very aggressive at raising rates. And right. It seems to be the the stock market is at all time highs or close to all time highs. Seems to be trending upward, but it, it definitely you know the, the the tune over here is interest rates. Where will they go? Because if they continue to rise or stay at if these are long term levels of where interest rates are going to be, these unrealized losses are going to continue to pile up because we just came out of an era of seven years or eight years of zero percent interest rates. And that's only going that it's going to take a while to unwind. And it's and and these unrealized losses will continue to persist, if only because that unwind is only in its infancy. Yeah. And, and I like uh, what he says down here at the bottom in 2024. Some banks will fail. We pretty much know that we just don't know how many. If eight banks fail, that would be on par with 2015 and 2017. So uh, he's pretty cool cat. Yeah, no, go, go, go check Wolf Street to follow. We appreciate that. Hey, let's get rolling around to our buddies over there in China. Uh, solar panel supplier links to alleged abuses in China imperil U.S. climate goal. Michael, if you're going to be an energy hypocrisy giant, you might as well start rolling out some serious solar panels. 
let's go ahead and let's take a look at uh, Miss Producer. If you could slide in the graphic that's titled U.S. Solar Panel Imports During Q2 of 21. Michael, let's take a look at this. The fi- the top five market or 79% of our uh, panels come from China. Yeah. Look at that. That's just nuts. It's pretty big. Um, it, and the rest and, of the world only gets 21%. Yes. So when you sit back and take a look, holy smokes. Now, let's go down to the next chart largest owners of planned u.s solar projects from 2021 to 2025 next era look at that bad dog we're talking 10,000 uh almost 11,000 kilowatt hours of solar going in um and you take a look at all those all of those companies are supporting uh, humanity abuse, as far as I'm concerned, without mm-hmm. having some kind of uh, program in place. Here's a quote out of it. The lack of transparency in China in the deserved skepticism that some have towards documentation provided by Chinese companies adds on an element of uncertainty that's difficult to remove or solve. These humanity abuses on these folks are just horrific. Yeah, it's 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 becoming hard to say solar is ESG. You can't really it, say that. Not. That you exa- you can't, especially when you see data like this. So I think the the sheen is coming off. I think that's you know probably why you see people shifting into wind because they're we're still waiting for the wind. We'll find out about where these wind fall. I'm sure the wind manufacturer are getting abused too i'm sure i'm sure it's all it, bad. It, it, yeah it, it, but the the sad part about the offshore wind is it's killing the whales let's see kill the people kill the whales you okay. know my stance on whales kill them uh, all. obscene energy demands of ai um you know you gotta love a good story like this um when we sit back and take a look, there's a fundamental mismatch between this technology and environmental sustainability, said Devires. Uh, 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 I'm hoping uh, the world's most prominent AI cheerleader, Sam Altman, the CEO of Open and I, says, "Quote: I think we still don't appreciate the energy needs of this technology." Really? (laughs) Why are all these gigantic server farms being built? And he says, we don't really understand. I think you're going to need every single bit of storage that you're going to need in server. Uh, We need AI is going to become the thing of the future. (laughs) It takes an incredible amount of power to train these models, to deploy these models. Data center is going to have to expand as long as in Divya, stock chart is pointed like this yep you're gonna see power go through the roof so it's yep. always a catch-22 with these people oh we're gonna we're gonna transition oh well now okay. we're gonna need us again whoops and and now the iea the international energy agency announced that energy related global co2 emissions rose yet again <laughs> of course <laughs> data centers for now are at least a small part but they are increasing in percentages <laughs> yeah so now i think if you you know i think a lot of the bitcoin community would tell you it's you know <clears throat> deploying these type of solutions you know deploying bitcoin into coin crypto mining is a way to solve this by taking I would agree. all of to taking you yeah. know so there, there's another side to this, but it is it is there's hilarious how there, everything needs to go AI. Well, we're going to need more power. There is a difference between a data center and cryptocurrency data mining. There is a significant difference because I am a Bitcoin fan for this one big, huge reason. Bitcoin mining 
when used with EMP operators, allows them to use stranded natural gas, stranded energy that would have been wasted and then provide revenue to deliver lower cost energy to the consumers. I love me Bitcoin mining when used properly. Well, it's a better revenue source for operators who, Absolutely. you know, especially when you have the arbitrage opportunity that right now with natural gas at a dollar seventy and and Bitcoin at, at whatever it is seventy thousand or whatever. So, um, but no, in terms of of the power needs for AI, it's only going to go up. So, you know, <laughs> everyone was talking about oil and gas demand is going away. Sam Altman says, no, 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 no. There was one comment buried in that article that says, well, maybe AI could l figure out how to use less energy. <laughs> I'm like, well, what? <laughs> okay. Just, SEC, I hope the AI drives that person off a cliff. That was not, he was, he was already removed from all investor relations, uh, job opportunities. He now no investor job for you, man. IEA at most divided point on oil demand since at least 2008. This is an absolutely crazy story here. So top headlines out of Reuters, producer OPEC and the IEA or the International Ag Energy Agency, one of my favorite organizations, um, are further apart than they have ever been for at least 16 years when it comes to their demand um, estimates specifically on crude oil. The gap between the IEA, which represents all of the industrialized countries, and the OPEX, which is the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, um, are so far off, it's about a difference of 1% world oil demand. That basically backs into the IEA thinks we'll have 1.2 million barrels uh, per day of demand increase, um, while in February, OPEC decided to say we think it's going to be 2.25 million barrels per day. That, again, works out to a 1% um, of world demand. Former head of the IEA's oil markets division, Neil Atkinson, he's got a strong quote. The IEA has a very strong perception that the energy transition will move ahead at a much faster pace. Both agencies have boxed themselves in with a position, which is why they have the enormous gulf in demand forecast. You never like to see the two research companies boxing themselves into a corner. That's really what you want out of your research facilities. It's unbelievable. Um the IEA did come out with a statement saying they were not going to comment on other organizational forecasts, but, quote, we expect to con uh, this to continue this year with mobility indicators suggesting that road and air traffic are stabilizing. OPEC doesn't have any rules against it. They say we have been very steadily steady with our 2023 oil demand forecast. Many other forecasters have started low and then continually revised up their 2020 forecast. Um, that's uh out of OPEC's Vienna office. OPEC will come and swing for the fences. They could care less. So, <laughs> you know, and, and again, who are you going to trust? The IEA, who clearly ha has been shown to have a political agenda. They would love the energy. You know, they would love demand to fall you know, for a variety of reasons. OPEC, you know, while they also have an interest in demand going up, they're a little bit more realistic. And I think this is a perfect time, uh, Miss Produce, if you don't mind showing up um, this chart here. OPEC optimistic on its demand for crude oil through 2024. I saw this in an S&P article. Look at the gap between them. Absolutely unbelievable. We got the lower line. That is um, um, where S&P's got it. The IEA is somewhere. S&P's even lower. I mean, who knows what they're doing? OPEC's on top. IEA in the middle so um i mean what does this mean it means the answer is probably somewhere in the middle you know if, if i were to draw a line i would draw a dotted line in between because that's probably where it's going to end up i bet both are wrong it converges it somewhere in the middle the iea has an incentive to say the energy transition um is coming maybe quicker than expected because they're getting funding based upon that. OPEC could care less about funding. They're getting it through oil production. So obviously they're going to um, maybe be more in tuned with the oil markets, but also they'll have an incentive to say oil demand will go up. But the answer is always somewhere in between. And and it just goes to show you the, 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 the difference going on right now. And it really matters. And you got to trust who you're getting your data from because you look at one, you see one thing, you look at another, you always got to take, you know, they call it a meta analysis. You really got to do a meta analysis, look at all the sources and come to our, where does the majority of the data, where's that foci of that, 
you know, where's the focus point of all that, um, all the different demand averages. So um, great article out of Reuters. Exploding uh, energy prices in California. Uh, this is really, uh, Miss Producer, if you could fly in electricity price increases in all sectors from 2008 to 2023. Look at Texas. It went down. <laughs> look at california it's up almost 98 percent from 2008 to 2024 yep. here's where some numbers that aren't in this article that matter michael okay uh prices or uh market share of energy produced by wind and solar has gone up from 4% to 15% over the last uh, same amount of time period, okay? But guess where most of that went? It, it's in Texas and California, but Texas has actually been using coal, natural gas, yep. and nuclear. And so it's kind of interesting to see how that, all that happens in there. Um, the transition... Uh, 1.75 gigawatts of utility scale solar and 14 gigawatt on residential rooftop solar, yep. which is failing. <laughs> 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 so here's where it gets really sca uh, scary in the cost and the reason why grid scale batteries to back up renewable generators multiplies the cost of utility scale solar programs about one million dollars per megawatt of rated grid capacity with four hours of discharge duration costs about 1.5 million dollars per megawatt these batteries can only last for four hours holy smokes okay Here's the difference. Texas has natural gas for backup and for standby and that they're trying to put in no natural gas and batteries. That's where it's really coming in. Uh, so when you sit back and take a look, uh, conclusion, California leaders know that rising prices are a huge problem. Really? Do they think they actually know? I don't think they know. I got tickled when I read that one, Michael. Yeah, I, 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 th I think the big, <laughs> I mean, it's California doing California things. I mean, $1 million or $1.5 million per megawatt capacity for four hours. Oh, that's, that's cost effective. It's not. And, and, and so the, the average, uh price per consumer that's per megawatt so it's not it's a little bit different but still it is. that's horrible the price per kilowatt hour um went from three cents to average of 17 cents during that same time period in the u.s what was the only difference in that whole time period the addition of 15 yep. percent uh, uh in the u.s renewables Oh, wow. So 98% increase and the average bill in California is horrific. Yeah, anyway. No. I